This is uh, an interesting group to be um, among. I thought I was going to get up and say things like how wonderful it is to be at Georgia State, how wonderful it is to see Emory colleagues, how wonderful it is to see students out so late at night. Um, but after Mr. Uh, Outler's remarks, which were amazing, I considered going home. <laughs> because I felt like what needed to be said had already been said, and I just really didn't know what I would add to that. Okay, so thank you for that intimidation. And then, after Dr. King got up, and as my daughter would say, called out my government name. <laughs> went to North Carolina, named my parents. I, you know, I got nervous. I, went, I didn't know what she was going to say next. Is she going to say, my husband is here, but she going to name old boyfriends? I didn't know what she was going to do. I didn't know where she was going with that. Uh, so it was a little, a little uh, intimidating. I mean, I was sitting there like, ooh. Okay. Uh, but thank you for the lovely introduction um, and for naming some things I'd done that I forgot about. Thank you uh, very much. So I'm afraid I don't have the wonderful passion, a little more low key, try not to put everybody to sleep, nor do I have the same knowledge about North Carolina, although I'm glad to know. <laughs> I'm glad to know I stand in those shoes. Um, but what I do want to do is take us on a trip down memory lane. Um, and in some ways, actually, if we'd had an opportunity to talk, it would have been wonderful if we'd flipped it. Because everything he said is an example of the history of what we used to do. It's only that now we have pockets of good teachers who get it. And they're often unsupported, as opposed to a collective enterprise. So you are an example of what I'll be talking about. And um, we'll see if you say ashe. OK, <laughs> say anything. OK, let's go back to 1970. It was a long time ago, but it wasn't so very long ago at all, not for most of us in this room. I'd like to take us to Horace Tate. Some of you know him as Senator Horace Tate. Um, he retired as a sen senator here, just up the way from where you are. Others know him as the head of the Black Teachers Association, the Georgia Teachers and Education Association in Georgia. 12,000 members strong. And I might say, before I go further, it is to him that I owe a debt for my knowledge about what I'll speak about tonight. It's his voluminous collection of artifacts that's actually helped me put the story, my story of segregated schools for 22 years together and take it to another place. So I, I need to acknowledge that. Horace Tate was also the confidant and education advisor for Martin Luther King. He was the person who helped Jimmy Carter get elected, first as governor um, and then for the country. He spoke very powerful words in 1970 when desegregation en masse across the South was about to be implemented. And here's what he said. There's evil in the land. And where there is evil, it must be perseveringly and vigorously pursued until it no more exists. Now, this is quite odd for 1970. This is a time when black educators should have been celebrating. They had been pushing for equality in Georgia since 1878 with Richard Wright. Horace Tate himself knew about the structures that created the Brown decision, which I will not be talking about tonight. He had participated in those structures. So he wanted Brown, and not only that, at the point of the Brown v. Board decision, he himself stood in an auditorium before his students and said, this is a wonderful time. You all are going to do well. America is finally going to be what America is supposed to be. So how then can we have him in 1970 saying something as difficult as there is evil in the land? Isn't he, after all, getting what he asked for? Well, Horace Tate was never known to mince words. And so in 1970, he explained exactly what he was talking about. And 
He said, I've lived in this society for 47 years, and 31 of them were under the evils of segregation. But in trying to wipe out segregation, it is not my desire, and it must not be your desire, to substitute a second class integration. For a second class integration is evil, no matter who says otherwise. Accompanying his lecture was also a booklet published by the 12,000 strong Georgia Teachers and Education Association. And in this booklet, they talked about in the same year, here's the problem. 99% of the school boards in Georgia are white. They have no history of having protected the interests of black children. What makes you think they're going to put structures into place right now that will protect the interests of the children. Instead, they argued, the politics of the period, of the moment, are such that they will be able to put guidelines into place that will preserve the interests of the children who have already been protected while diminishing the opportunities for the children who are supposed to get opportunities under Brown. So Tate says second class integration is more evil than segregation because he said it has a way of entering into the psyche and hearts and minds of little black children and making them believe they cannot succeed. I'm looking at him, but this is a direct quote, okay, that they cannot succeed. He says, I quote, it steals from the Negro boy or girl the motivation that makes him feel good, that makes him feel that he's not good enough for anything. It doesn't, considers the, it doesn't consider the mores, the customs, the traditions, and the feelings of black communities. Now, this is what Horace Tate said in 1970, but no one listened. We could not hear him. Instead, the 12,000 black teachers who had comprised the Georgia Teachers and Education Association were forced by NEA to merge with the Georgia Education Association, thus creating the Georgia Association of Educators, of which we are all familiar today. So, all of the structures and the power that was part of their organization was merged into another that had no history of protecting the interests of black children. Not only did we get rid of their teacher associations and thus their voice, inclusive of Georgia, we fired 31,000 black teachers across the South who knew how to educate black children. And we, we replaced them with young white teachers. Added to that, Historians, my colleagues, wrote a storyline that said the only response black teachers had to desegregation was that they were worried about losing their jobs. Which makes the teachers look self-serving, self-interested. This is really all about me. I don't care about what's best for black children. I just care about my job. And so what happens? We proceed then with what is, in effect, a rescue model. Let's rescue the black children from these awful black teachers and take them into schools where they will be well taken care of. <clears throat> well, if you proceed with that model, it comes from the assumption that nothing good happened until desegregation. It suggests there's nothing to know about what happened before. But what I'd like to do this evening is take us back and see if we can unpack even more what Dr. Tate was talking about. What is it that he knew that we don't about what they had, what they were giving up? Your theme for me is a wonderful opportunity to do that because the theme invites a return. And so does the person for whom the lecture is named. Uh, thank you, Dean. Oh, Dean left. Thank you, Dean, who mentioned what Benjamin Mays was talking about earlier, but I want to add a piece to that. 
Benjamin Mays in 1950 was writing for the Pittsburgh Courier. And here's what he said. The race problem, here's one of the many things he said. The race problem cannot be solved apart from history. If history is used to stir up bitterness, to justify segregation or inequality, this is not a good use. However, if it is used to chart, quote, a better and more humane course for the future, then it's good. So it's the latter that I think is important for this evening, this notion of using the past to help us question the present and perhaps chart some new directions. So I just want to make a couple of points before beginning, um, and then we'll move into what was it like and what have we, what have we become. So these couple of points, because people always misunderstand me, but I can tell that the students at Georgia State are very well educated, so nobody will misunderstand me. But I'm going to say it just in case. There are a few people in here not from Georgia State, and they have not learned this. So people always say, does that mean you're going to say that segregation was good or right? I think John Hope Franklin captures it well when he says, if you like segregation, you must not have been there. Okay. So we're not saying that segregation was good. Segregation was not good. It was problematic. The unequal treatment of black children was a shameful period in the United States history, and I think we should never forget it. However, reducing segregation writ large to being only what white school boards intended misses the resilience of a community. In other words, it ignores Henry Bullock's idea of unintended consequences. It assumes that because you meant me to be X, X is all I became, which minimizes my capacity to respond and to be an agent in my own life. As many people have said, one of the things that is important for us is to go back and fetch what we forgot. It's OK to be able to go back and fetch what we forgot about black educators and about Brown. So then, let's begin with a history. And I'll try to, I didn't do any of my little fun PowerPoint stuff. You're just going to have to hang with me, OK? Because I was afraid it'd be a little, little distracting. Um, but I want you to hang with me as we go back to history, even if you don't like history. And then those of you who want to talk more about the present, I'll, I'll come to that shortly. In the history, um, I've decided to focus primarily on teachers because Dr. Williams told me that I should. And so <laughs> we could, yeah, no. So we, there are lots of things that we actually could talk about, you know, curriculum, leadership. There are a number of aspects of black schools and segregation that are important uh, and that I talk about in other places. Advocacy, there are a lot of pieces of it. But tonight, I want to confine the talks just to teachers. Picking up Ambrose Caliver, who's also speaking in 1950, saying how the Negro teacher has been the keystone of progress for black children. He says that it was the black teacher who had the holding power of school and who helped students to advance to higher education levels. So rather than dismissing Dr. Tate, let's go back to these teachers. All right, now, <clears throat> Dewey um, said, and black teachers did this all the time, that if you're teaching, you should go from the known to the unknown. You hear black teachers say that all the time. Begin with the children with what they know, and then move to the unknown. You know, don't start talking about something way out there that nobody but you knows what you're talking about. So since I'm going to begin with teachers, and I'm talking about teachers tonight, I actually want to begin with the familiar story about black teachers. When I started this journey 22 years ago, the stories weren't as familiar. There were people who had written about them, wonderful scholars like Faustine Jones and Jackie Irvine. But apparently, nobody read the Journal of Negro Education. Or they didn't pay attention to things that were published by Howard University Press. And so the fact that there was this early literature, most people didn't pay attention to. In the last 22 years, we have started to pay more attention to it. And there are many wonderful young scholars who write about these teachers. So that, of taking this notion of going from the known to the unknown, let's go with the part about black teachers that many of us know and some of us in the room actually remember. So what is it that everybody remembers about black teachers? They cared. Okay? That's what everybody talks about. They cared. They were mother-like. They were father-like. They were interested in my development. They cared. They cared. They cared. And it, and it always transcends 
subject matter. It doesn't matter whether the teachers are in elementary school or high school. It's the same notion. They cared. They cared. What are some of the kinds of philosophies that they espoused that show this caring? Well, they talked about how we believe in teaching the whole child, not just math or English or whatnot. I'm not just teaching a subject. I'm teaching children. They said, you know, we can't, you can't teach a child you don't know. You, how can you plan instruction if you don't know who the child is? They said, you know, when you want for somebody else's child what you want for your child, then you're ready to teach. But until you want for somebody else's child what you want for your child, you're not ready. These ideas are part of this public memory about black teachers. But if you look closely at their schools, we can see, dare I say, a scholarly overview of what they were actually doing and how they got there. And I think it's very important for us to go over this part. Because otherwise, you can assume, well, the teachers, you know, they just they were kind people. They were just nice, like a new iteration of the mammy, good caretakers. So I think it's important to understand how they came to be what their students remember them as being, because it's that part that's instructive for us in the present. So within the environment, I, wanted, I want to deal with three areas. I want to deal with their philosophy and kind of practices. I want to deal with how they worked with parents. And then I want to deal with how they did their networks. Okay, so that's where we're going. So let's start first with this notion of caring and what happened in the school climate. Um, this is my language and not theirs. But I think you have to understand black schools as places that had both interpersonal caring and institutional caring. What do I mean by that? The interpersonal caring is the one-on-one -on -one encouragement. You can do anything uh, you want to do. Okay? Uh, the best minds, the best equipment may be over the way, but the best minds are right here. It was the one-on-one. -on -one. You can go to college. You can do good things. That's the interpersonal caring. That's what happens when a teacher is able to close his or her door and speak directly with the student or a principal. But the interesting thing about black schools is that the interpersonal caring is not all of what happened. There is a school ethos of caring. So you don't have just individual maverick teachers doing a great job. You have a school ethos that says, we care about your success. What are some examples then of this school ethos in black schools? Well, one of the things they said was that black children were mistreated in the larger society. Because they were mistreated in the larger society, guess what they needed to know? They need to know something about their history. They need to know their history. They needed black history programs. They needed black history books. They needed supplemental teaching on, um, on black accomplishments. They even brought black speakers into their schools. My mother-in-law talks about how she saw Lakes and Hughes just sitting in her high school. Okay, Jackie Robinson. They, they bring the people into the schools because they want them to understand you can make it because here are examples of people who actually made it. They said black children are segregated. So therefore, they need to know that they have value. So they created extracurricular programs before Howard Gardner talked about multiple intelligences and said that everybody has a skill and talent. They have 98% of their children in schools involved in the extracurricular programs. So you like to sing, sing. You like to talk, get in the teacher's club. You can do band, do it up. Whatever you like to do, there was something there for all of them. And not only did they, they participate in the club, but they structured the extracurricular activity so that at least once a year, you had to come on stage and do it before your peers. Okay? The kids that I know about might act up for me, but they are going to do their best in front of their peers. This was all a part of well, the children need these opportunities. They need the opportunities to perform and see what they can be. And the people in the audience need the opportunities to learn the etiquette 
of social behavior. You see, if they went to the Fox Theater, the Fox Theater was segregated then. It was a side door you had to go in, which I thought about when I was at Wicked the other day. I started to ask them, where was the side door? But I didn't ask where the side door. I walked in proudly through the main door and took my seat. But if you can't participate in the larger America, then where will you learn how to be a participant? Okay. So this was a part of the school. The assembly was also a place where the principal could tell everybody collectively how brilliant they were, that they were smarter than the white kids who had more stuff, that they shouldn't pay them any attention, go do your thing. So the assembly was a conscious way to build up who they were. Black children were isolated from the American promise. Therefore, guess what they needed to teach, Dr. Hahn? Civic education. They needed to practice, where is Jillian? Democratic participation. And so what do we see among black schools in the 40s when black teachers aren't voting? We see uh, presidential elections, voting booths, preparing students to understand. As my husband and I were just talking about this morning, isn't it odd that both of us at the same time in our little black schools were being forced to be a part of a presidential election? I remember it well because they made me uh, go after Nixon. No, it wasn't Nixon. No, that was the second time I had to do it. I forgot who had to do the first time. That's off the script. But anyway, the point is, <laughs> what happened to us was not accidental, okay, but was a planned part. So the point is that what black teachers did in black schools was to use the school as a way to reconstruct the negative message that black children were receiving outside of the school and give the children instead a positive message about who they were and what they could become. For me, this is very important because it's a counter message. It's a message, it's a message that says you can be successful even though people out there are saying you can't be. In effect, these black teachers were preparing black children for a world that did not exist. They anticipated this world but it did not exist at the time they started it. Now, in addition to these specific professional ideas about how to work with black children, black teachers also had specific ideas about how to work with the black community. Now, as an intro to what the teachers did, I just want to note that there are some things that black parents did. Uh, black parents came to PTA. This would be a relatively small crowd uh, for a black PTA meeting at a high school. Uh, they came, their children are performing, they enjoyed it. Some people said they didn't have anything else to do, you know, segregation, but for whatever reason, they were there. They came to PTA. They supported the financial needs of the school. They had bake sales and king and queen contests, and they used it, the money to buy stage curtains and playground equipment and pianos and whatever the school board refused to give their children. They used those monies to supply that. And some parents provided advocacy for the schools. These were the ones who went to the school board and said, you know, we would like a new school for our children or whatever. Some of them paid light bills. Now, everyone wasn't an advocate. Those who participated as advocates typically were ones who were independent business owners, people who could not lose their jobs. Now, what's important for me is that the parents rarely came to the school during the school day, which is interesting because they'd flunk parental involvement by our current model. They didn't come to the school during the day because they said that would be interrupting the teacher. Okay, the teacher needs the instructional time. And they also focused on what was good for all the children, a collective model, not mine, all the children. And we'll come back to that later. So, but the question is, how, why is it that the black parents supported the school? I mean, all we hear today is African-American parents won't come to school. African-American parents, like it's a disease, they won't come to school, okay? Why is it that they did that? And I think the answer to why the parents supported the school lies with what we know about the teachers and their behaviors. You see, the teachers believed in their philosophy of teaching that it was their job to let the parents know what was going on and what the school needed. Many of you in your history classes have read about the Rosenwald schools, right? Right? Somebody? Yeah. In the Rosenwald schools, the assumption is that the parents got together and they got the schools, right? 
The parents did get the schools. But guess what's missing? It's black teachers who went into the community and told the parents who they needed to write and what they needed to do. And they're very explicit about this. They even have in their journals, go to the school board and when they meet on Tuesday night and tell them what you need for your school. And this is what you tell them that you need. And so the teachers saw it as their job to give the parents access to the information that they needed to help the children to be successful. They believed it was their job to be in the community, to go out, because why? You can't teach people you don't know. You have to know them. Many people want to say, well, black teachers were just in the community because um, they lived there. Some of them did live there. But remember that the black community was not defined geographically. So a community of a high school could be 30 miles out to the furthest church or home or, or whatever. So they were expected to know those children just like they were the ones who lived close to the, to the school. More than that, some of these parents, of these teachers, and, and I have a new respect for this because my husband has had to travel. Some of these teachers had family someplace else. They're living in teacheries at the school. Normally, they went home on the weekend. But once a month, in many settings, they were asked to stay over the weekend. Why? So you can get out in the community and see the children and be seen and talk to the parents and go to the churches because you can't teach people you don't know. One last thing that teachers did with parents, um, they worked in ways that were respectful of the community. Language is one of them. It's what we call now talking down, okay? So if you are going to speak in such a way that parents feel intimidated, threatened, they aren't likely to want to talk to you because you make them feel less than. So they imitate their principals who were very adept at changing their language for whatever the audience was. It's what I often say at Emory in the qualitative class. It's our responsibility to meet people at their cultural location, not theirs to meet us where we are. And so black teachers understood this and they actually adopted, without betraying their professionalism, the norms of the community in their language, in their, speak, in, the, in their speech, in their customs. And so little things, like the African-American community likes you to say hello. You're supposed to speak. I watched that always. When I was at Chapel Hill, I said, this is strange. White people don't speak. You're supposed to, go, when you go down, you just you say hello to everybody. You know, hey, how you doing? I don't have to know you. Hey, you know, what you doing? And it's a, we, you know, you're laughing, but it's a, I actually see it when I go into schools. And I find myself, as an educated adult, very offended when I see a principal who walks right by me and doesn't say hello. Like, you're supposed to say hello. You don't even have to know who I am. I'm a human being. Speak, okay? So they understood. They made it their business to be, shall we say, culturally relevant and know what the norms were and utilize them intentionally. So the result is the symbiotic relationship in black schools. Well, what's happening is that parents are parenting the school. Follow me. Parents are parenting the school because they are supplying for the school what it cannot do for itself, the physical resources. And teachers are parenting the children because they are doing what the parents cannot do for their children, which is to give them access to another life. So you have this symbiotic, this, this relationship, this reciprocity that's going on, built on trust. You're doing for me, I'm doing for you, right? So the point then is that parental support in black schools didn't just happen. It was cultivated through particular professional norms. Let's do the last one. In addition then to these teachers having this professional orientation and philosophy, these structures for parental involvement, they were also participants in a professional network that taught these ideas. They didn't just get them accidentally. 
Um, this is an exciting piece for me, and it's one that I really wish I could do at length with all the audio. Uh, but I was afraid if I did, we'd, we'd never get out. So I'm going to tell you, and if you invite me back, I'll bring the audio. Uh, so you can hear some of these things for yourselves, because they're amazing to listen to. Now, these teachers were part of a professional network. And in this professional network, they learned how to do the things that I'm talking about. It wasn't, Dr. Kadri, it wasn't an accident. They were taught how to do these particular things. That was important to me, because when I finished Hello, uh, Their Highest Potential, and I'd go places and speak, everywhere I was, where there was a black student of a certain age, a black person of a certain age in the audience, they would say, I went to a school just like that. Went to a school just like that. Are any of you from segregated schools? You went to a school just like that? In some ways. You don't know necessarily about what the teachers did, but kind of in some ways. And so I couldn't figure out, well, how is it that a teacher in Florida is trying to get his children to reach their highest potential? I thought Mr. Dillard, you know, was the only one who knew about their highest potential. But apparently all the black teachers all over, all over the South wanted the children to reach their highest potential. How do you explain ideas that cross geography and time? And people are using almost the same language. And I put forth that what I learned in Hello Professor in collaboration with Dr. Ulysses Bias is that it is that professional network where they learn these ideas. The interesting thing about the professional, uh, the whole notion of professional network to me is that uh, black teachers didn't know they weren't professionals until they got desegregated. Because they, they, they thought they were professionals. They said it all the time. You should behave like a professional. Or her behavior was very unprofessional. Okay. They thought they were professionals, but apparently they weren't. That's what the latest research says. Uh, they weren't. So what was going on in this network? Their network had national meetings. It had state meetings. It had district meetings. Georgia had it, later called regions. Georgia had 11 regions. It had local meetings. It had professional development in schools. I can't go over all the intricacies of it, but the ideas were able to travel through this network so that the classroom teacher could own them. So just to give you kind of a, a little example, we could go to 1957 and take Mordecai Johnson, who is talking um, about black children and the kinds of things we know, don't we, what it takes to help black children to succeed. We must be the agents of what we know and take the, pa the, the panel on testing and see them interrogate, literally interrogating the ETS representatives about testing, then watch it come to Georgia, where they have a state meeting not very far, the old city auditorium, okay, from where we are, where they talk about testing with Allison Davis and others. Then we can watch them go into the 11 regions, 8,000 teachers talking about testing, and we can trace it all the way down into a school where a local principal is saying, let's look at our testing, let's chart how our students are doing, let's watch how their grades are going up, 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 up as we continue to focus on them. So this network in ways I, I, I can't fully go over tonight, actually you can watch ideas travel all along it. But what I do want to do is give you a sense of the kinds of things that are happening in this space because New teachers are learning how to teach. They're learning the ideology. Experienced teachers are finding among themselves a solidification of their views. So they're able then to speak with more passion because they know how it's working here and how it's working there. So let's just take a moment and look at it. So on the state level, they're meeting, as I said, once a year. They always had children, and they could sing. The children were there, the bands are there, they're very focused on black children, always on black children and professional ideas. So it wasn't just take the professional idea, how will we make this work for black children? They were allowed to be in conversation with professors at universities, with George, well, not Georgia State or Emory, not until the 60s, but in, le in earlier years, Fort Valley, Morehouse, Spelman, et cetera. So that there was not this divide between higher ed and public schools that we often see today. But they were in ongoing conversation with each other. This was on the state level. Who are some of the people that were there? Uh, Horace Mann Bond. How about W.E.B. Du Bois? We'll go back to the earlier years. 
Uh, how about Martin Luther King? Uh, at their last meeting, uh, Adam Clayton Powell was there, and, and he did a great, we have all this on tape. He did a great lecture. He was a little drunk, but it was all right. <laughs> it was all right, because he, you know, he really, it was also 1970, he was calling people out. He was like, why are y'all getting ready to merge and go into an association where you have no power, and you had all this power for the last 50 years? So they said when they, he took his jacket off, they knew it was getting ready to be live. Uh, and it is a joy to hear. So at their annual meetings, they hear up close people that we read about. That's my point. They are seeing these people up close year after year after year. And they're going into their curriculum meetings to talk about English or math or whatever. Now, after the state meeting, you have the region meetings. And these regional meetings under black educators were carefully scripted can look at the documents, they are very clear because they want every region to be talking about the same thing. And what the regions talked about was, was the topic of the state meeting. So what we're trying to do is layer the knowledge. So we hear it, we can now talk in our region about how it's working and, 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 um, and continue to let it move forward. I thought it'd be interesting to look at some of the kinds of things that they were talking about. I'm gonna name just one on the regional level and then I'm gonna go to local. In October 1946, they were talking about the understanding teacher. Do we really understand children? And it was discussed in every region in Georgia in 1946. When they left their regional meetings, they went to their local meetings. And I, I, I think this will speak for itself. I used just 1946 because I wanted you to get a sense of just how uh, diverse and yet powerful the conversation was in Georgia. In Henry County, teachers are discussing, they're using movies, discussions, demonstrations, and lectures that will promote professional growth. And they're working, this is the local level, they're working in work groups that are organized to meet the needs of individuals. And in Henry County, they've broken the teachers into three groups, and that's what they're doing. In Moultrie, they're having a reading conference because they said it, this was an outgrowth of an awareness on the part of the teachers that the reading efficiency of the pupils was not up to standards and they wanted to find more effective ways to aid the children. In DeKalb County, they were having inter-school visits of the various facilities to look at the classroom work and the methods of teaching. They had radar sheets. And after they went and did their ratings and their observations, then it says they were going to discuss their observations at the January meeting. Well, why were they bothering to do all this stuff at the local county, local level? Well, Chris County says it well. They said, you know, we need to develop feelings of professionalism among teachers, feeling of unity, like we're a professional family. So if we are a professional family and teachers feel close, it'll improve classroom instruction because we'll be working together. What are some of the topics that they're talking about? In Early County, the intercultural program. In Elbert County, citizenship. In Henry County, health, in the National Negro Health Week. Uh, in another county, testing. They talked about batteries A, B, and C. They were given to the sixth and seventh grades, the achievement tests, and they said their scores were much better than the term before, so they are monitoring to make sure. In fact, testing in Georgia was a black educator's idea. Uh, they did such a good job that the white educators said, wow, we should imitate you. <laughs> That's a fact. Um, in Peach County, they were doing action research. <laughs> they said, I called it action research. They said they wanted to find out and record as much as possible about the pupils' abilities, interests, likes, dislikes, home background experiences, health, and emotional state. This is what black teachers were doing locally. Now, on the school level, school meetings were professional development seminars. So in Gainesville, they spent a year doing a curriculum survey, interviewing parents, other teachers, students, trying to figure out where our strengths and weaknesses are. They talk in faculty meeting about how to construct teacher-made tests. Teachers look at each other's tests and give feedback to one another based on what they've discussed in the meeting. They even talk about, let's rate our principal. You, you fit in what we think you should be doing? You know, let's talk about it. So, here then is the point. They are exposed to a cutting edge professional world. They are layering their knowledge 
And it's because they are exposed to the ideas and they're layering the knowledge on all these different levels that we hear them say the things that they're saying. The point, thus, they aren't just making it up. It didn't happen accidentally that black people of a certain age remember the same kinds of schools. It was actually intentional. Now, these structures that they had look like the white professional world, but they differed in their norms, accountability, structures, and focus of the talk. And I think that's important. So that's a little quick foray, well, not quick enough, foray into the past. Let's, let's take a moment and say, well, does it matter today? I mean, history, after all, doesn't, I mean, it's nice. You know, so black teachers did a good job. Let's clap, you know, yeah, good job. You know, good, write it in the history book. Um, what difference does that make to me today? I can't go to the meeting, you know. Last time I checked, it was just you on stage. Martin Luther King wasn't there. I'm not getting to see these other, Allison Davis wasn't there. So what difference does it make for us today? And I want to suggest that it does make a difference for us today. And, and I want to use the history to ask questions because the history won't give us answers. And if I tried to give you answers, I'd be off um, the ground on which I can stand and defend. But I can uh, raise questions. And so I want to take the philosophy and put it against some things that I just see and hear in public education. This is not a study. Uh, I don't have IRB approval, Dr. Jensen, <laughs> uh, for this part. This is just what I know as a human being, OK? Because I am a parent, all right? I'm an educator, and I spend time in schools. Let's take the care ethic and the interpersonal. We believe in you, right? We believe in you. When I used to do professional development, when I lived in the Northeast, one of the favorite things teachers used to tell me is all the kids look alike to me. I want to ask them, were they blind? Because I don't actually know how you can say all the children look alike. They're different sizes, shapes, heights, colors. Hair looks different. They talk different. I don't understand that. But what that is is a benign form of I refuse to recognize that black children or any other children in my class need anything special. So I'm just going to treat them all the same. Not sure what that does to the care ethic when I refuse to let you be who you are. And I say, I can't see you because all of you all look the same. Or what about caring when you have a white teacher say to a black boy in a gifted class? This is an easy problem. Let's let do this. Even the children in the class go, ooh. Ooh. Or what happens when a black teacher says to a white parent talking about a black athletic squad, it's going to be a ghetto squad? See, when I hear things like that, it's hard for me to imagine that the interpersonal caring, we believe in you, your capacity to succeed, it's hard for me to imagine that we are as fully implementing that as we might. What about the institutional messages? You can be anything you want to be, showcase your history, you know, learn how to develop your multiple intelligences. Well, when I go into schools, the black history programs I see are a sham. It's that terrible. And even, when they, even when they get people up to dance, they don't even get good dancers. <laughs> the people can't dance, and one of them, they, they had to run off the stage because somebody's costume fell off. I mean, it actually is a caricature of black history that does not make black children proud of who they are, but in effect makes them ashamed. If this is all my race has offered to America, and then we sitting up in here with everybody, and this is what it's about, I'm not sure that's an institutional message that respects who black children are. Or if the clubs are segregated, it's amazing to me that the National Honor Society has very few black children in it. Black teachers said, when a child can speak a language, any language, including Ebonics, they've demonstrated their ability to learn. There's nothing wrong with that child's brain. So if the child has the ability to learn based upon his 
capacity to speak any language, then black teachers said we ought to be able to teach them. Okay? Because the problem is not that the children can't learn. So when I look at these national honor societies and I see white children, if it's a desegregated school, so called desegregated school, but the black children are all, you know, I don't know, what are they in? I don't know, the French club or whatever. Not having anything against the French club, but not in the honor societies. It seems to me it sends a message, as Significant Fordham talked about, that white is smart and black is not. Um, and I don't see opportunities for children to showcase anything. So here's my question related to this whole notion of care, interpersonal, institutional. In our new and better segregated world, where are all the interpersonal and institutional messages telling black children they can be anything they want to be? Are schools now changing the negative societal images, or are they reinforcing the negative societal image? Second, what about the parents? Well, uh, there was this reciprocal support. We talked about that. Where are the black parents today? Well. We don't know where they are, but schools often talk about where they aren't. You know, they're not at the conferences. They're not, they, we don't see them. What about the collective ethos? We're trying to help all the children, which was a part of the black model. Uh, most often when black children succeed in desegregated schools, what I see is in a European model, American, competitive. Let me get in here and volunteer so I can make sure my child gets the benefit of the doubt, which is very different than the African communal model that says what's best for all the children. What about the trust that was at root in the black schools? I'm not sure I've ever heard a conversation among black parents in the last five to 10 years where they were happy. Pretty much every black parent I know is mad. Whether their kids are in private school, public school, desegregated school, segregated school, we're just mad. Um, just angry, and part of it is this notion of, I don't know what they're doing. You know, I'm doing the best I can to get my child out of school, but I don't know what's going on here. And so we see people manifested in very elegant ways. Could you explain to me uh, just what you had in mind when you gave uh, my child a C plus? You know, or you see somebody else go up there and say, look at here, what are y'all doing? You know, you see the fussing, okay? <laughs> But either way, there's not very much trust. It's gone. What about the school outreach, schools going into communities rather than expecting communities to always come into schools? I've only seen it one time um, in my now 20 years in, in Atlanta. So here's the question. What explains the lack of cooperation between black communities and schools now? Is it all the parents? And what's our responsibility to bring parents in? Finally, on the professional development, this history of professional activity among black teachers, where they talked about curriculum and created this collective ethos of what will we do for black children. I thought it'd be interesting today to go to the GAE website uh, to see where we've come to. GAE says that they're an advocacy group to stand up for education. They provide legal service, government relations, communications, and professional development workshops. You know how many they've provided, they said, on the website this fall? Three. Three, for all the teachers in the state of Georgia. Um, now, advocacy was important, and it was a part of GT and EA, and at another time I could talk about that. But advocacy was not all what GT and EA was, and it appears that in the morphing, well, let me put it as a question. What happened to the layered ongoing development that helped teachers become teachers, that connected them with higher education, and that workshops were led by teachers? Where did that go? It seems to be gone. Now, I also took some time to look at Teacher's College Record and look at some of the new books. Because I, you know, I like books, so let's see what some of the new books. Here's some of the new books that are coming out. Reclaiming Our Teaching Profession, The Power of Educators Learning in Community. And this new book spells out how to create professional learning communities. Another new book, The Networked Teacher, this book describes what effective social networks for teachers should look like. Then there was another new book, Ethnographic Interviewing for Teacher Preparation and Staff Development. And it helps teachers uh, do inquiry into their own practice. This is my question. 
Didn't we do that already? I think we've done all of those things. The ideas are not new. So as I close, I just want to say it's par for the course for black teachers. These are the ones who increase the literacy rate, decrease the dropout rate, increase the college attendance rate, and began to create higher test scores once they finally got some equipment in the 1960s. And they did it without having all of these things that other schools have. It's possible that these people may have known something about how to educate black children. It's just that we have been slow to embrace it. So I think we have to continue, as Benjamin May said, to support the ideal of integration. But we must also recognize the truth of what Horace Tate said. Integration was supposed to give black children more than what they had. Not just exchange one set of problems for another. And in some locales, there hasn't even been and even exchange. There are children who don't have the facilities and resources, and they lost the care in teachers too. So if that's the case, maybe that's what Dr. Tate was prophesying might happen if we implemented desegregation the way it was being implemented in 1970 when he predicted it's a second class integration. So what I'm advocating is a reclaiming of this African-American pedagogical model. We don't talk enough about it. Why aren't the letters we heard tonight in a textbook somewhere, along with case studies of teachers who are doing it and doing it well, even in this climate? Where is that? Why is it, Dr. Jensen, don't take my job, but why is it schools of education, that's my department chair, why is it schools of education spend more time worried about what the State Department said than we do following the model of people who know how to teach? Why aren't we teaching people how to teach black children when we have a history of doing that? I think one might say, well, Maybe it doesn't work anymore. Well, we saw it, right? We just saw it. Most of you know about the KIPP schools, right? The KIPP schools were founded because a black teacher felt so sorry for them, they didn't know what they were doing, about to flunk out of teaching before Christmas. And so a black teacher said, come here, let me teach you how to teach. And now we have the KIPP schools. I see it in the Titus schools, Emory's new Titus program, as I go out into seven of these schools in DeKalb County, I see amazing teachers and principals talking about teaching with a heart, raising test scores, doing amazing jobs with black children. The problem is these are not the schools that people talk about, that it is a black school in DeKalb County, Champion Middle, that had the highest test scores in DeKalb County over the gifted high school. When was that in the newspaper? When there are really good black teachers, why aren't we hearing about them? And yet we know from Gloria Latson Billings that they're out there. Okay? We know they're out there. And Gloria will let us see that this model is not race specific. Black teachers did it, but anybody can as Gloria shows in her book. And not only can anybody do it, but it can be effective for all children because it is human to want to be cared about and have somebody push you to your highest potential. So I'm saying that at the root of reform, we seem to have missed these basic concepts of professionalism and ideology, this notion of inspiration and aspiration that are at the root of children learning. See, I don't think it matters how many times I stay after school to redo, do extra tutoring in math. If I have not inspired the children to want to learn math, they're not gonna learn any more after school than they learn at school. <laughs> okay, and if they don't as aspire to pass the test, we assume that they're not passing the test because they can't pass it. Maybe they don't care. Maybe it's just not that important. So 
inspiration and aspiration, what black educators seem to understand, seem to be off the radar screen in schools of ed, in the political conversations. We don't seem to be pushing anybody on that. So if that's the case, given all that I have said in this relatively long time, let's go back and ask Dr. Tate. Dr. Tate, what do you think about all of this? Dr. Tate said, well, you got a second class integration. You accept it. But Dr. Tate also, at the end of that lecture, gave us the hope. He says, we must hasten the day when second class integration is no longer in existence. Because what man has made bad, he can make good if only he has the desire and the will to do so. Sounds like Asa, doesn't it? Okay. So let's close in with Dr. Mays. Dr. Mays, what do you have to say about this? I had Dr. Mays on tape too, by the way. Dr. Mays, what do you have to say about this? So in his closing lecture to the graduating class in 1967, Benjamin Mays says to the graduates, you cannot cheat on a job where great responsibility rests on your shoulders. And so it is true for us. We hold the legacy. It is now becoming common knowledge. Even as of tonight, you have more of the knowledge. If I have the knowledge, I have the responsibility. What do I do with responsibility? I cannot cheat on a job when so great a responsibility rests on my shoulders. That's all I have to say. We have a, a brief period of time, just a small period of time. If there are some pressing questions for Dr. Siddle Walker, she said that she would answer some questions this evening because I told her to. I try to do what Brian tells me to do. Any questions? <laughs> you again. <laughs> uh, masterful uh, information and presentation. Could you comment, I was just struck by um, the fact that you emphasize responsibility in an era when what we hear more about is accountability. Just what would you say about that? One of the ways I have to always think about everything is to go back to the history because that's the piece that I know. And so if I think about responsibility uh, for black educators, then I'd go back to, where's my class, 1917. I've been spending a lot of time in that era because that's the chapter I'm writing right now. And I would argue things in 1917 uh, were pretty bad for black children. Um, well, in the decades leading up to that, they were pretty bad. So much so that Du Bois says at the AU conference in 1911, Things are actually worse than they were at the end of Reconstruction. So things are bad, but what black educators do is look at a climate, figure out how to exploit a climate, call a meeting, so they begin to have backroom conversations, use the press in powerful ways to get their message out there. So there's a counter message to the lar larger message. And so they, rather than being repressed by the setting, actually behave in what I think is a responsible manner because they exploit everything they can to get what they want for black children. If I overlay that into now, I don't know that we have assumed collective responsibility. I think we do individual hacking at the problem. 
And so Georgia State has a great urban education program. And Emory's trying to have an urban education program. And we've got great teachers over here and over here. But we're all disconnected from each other. I would think even those of you who go to ARA, we love going to ARA. It's a lot of fun seeing each other. But when is the last time we had a substantive conversation behind closed doors? Which, by the way, they did at their national meetings. But that's the advocacy part. We'll talk about that another night. But when have we taken what we have to exploit that climate and create the networks that would allow us to respond collectively? We haven't done it. But they, I don't think we've done it. I think we've done good jobs with individual things, but we don't have a mass collective response. And I think they did. And that's how I think about responsibility. In focusing on the student, do you think the access um, to the free flow of information and increasing presence and strength of, and strength of capitalism um, with not needing a formal education is a cause for the declining interest in a formal education? And if so, why? And if not, then why not? OK, I need to repeat that, because I'm not sure I got it all. OK, you know, because you were reading. So do I think the you, access to education? With the access to the free flow of information uh -huh. and the increasing presence and strength of capitalism with not needing a formal education is a with, cause. Well, with capitalism not yes, needing formal? Right, right. Because in some, um, because if you, because there are some individuals who have managed to succeed without a formal education. I see. You're right, talking yes, about, uh, what's his name, LeBron. Right, yeah, that's right. Okay. Right, yeah, high school education. Right. So without a formal education, do you think that is a reason for the, for the decline in interest in a formal education? And if yes, why? And I guess okay. how would you rank those reasons? Okay, so I'm going to take the notion about the decline in the interest of education, this notion of decline in the interest of education. You don't have to have an education. Would you, right here. Well, right, you don't have to have a formal a education. A formal education right. in order to do some of the things that people are able to do right. and then make lots of money. Right. I, I think you're going directly to what was also raised earlier, which is it is true that education has been a sacred cow in our community with the belief that if you get educated, you will, in fact, have access to these things that other non-educated people won't have. Um, and thus, you should get educated. If we flip that around, I again have to go back to the history to think about the present. It seems to me that what black educators managed to do in the past was fail to define ed education in rigid terms. So we talk a lot about industrial, you know, in so many schools, that's all they know to teach. Booker T. Washington and W.B. Du Bois were in a debate in 1906 over industrial education versus classical education. And in, in colleges, that's often all black people get taught about what black teachers were doing. But on the ground, there's no debate. Scholarly, there was a debate. But if you go into the schools and look at the curriculum, what you see is that they were preparing children for whatever the variety of avenues might be. So. They were as careful in their preparation for children for industrial education that they didn't think were going to college as they were a classical education. There is no competition between the two. But children, every child was, here we go, educated to his or her highest potential. So kids were able to go in differing spaces and ways. If I think about that history of it, then I'm not so sure that today is that much different. In order to have a good job, the stats show you need at least two years of education beyond high school. And for every LeBron, I'm, I am saying that right, right? LeBron. I just get upset every time they call his name and they name his high school. I just wish somebody would give that boy an honorary degree <laughs> so they can at least put a college behind his name and not embarrass that. But for everyone who can play basketball like he can, 
how many thousands of little black boys are out there who will never get there? So this notion that there really are opportunities is more of a misnomer than it is a reality. And I think we fail when we refuse to let the children, when we refuse to tell the children how poor their chances are without some form of education, whatever that might be. And since there's nobody else up, I have one more question. Thank you for that question, though. That was a great question. That was a great question. Yeah, thank you. I don't think I need this mic. I have a question, and I know this is a loaded question, but I was just sitting here. You did a wonderful job, by the way. At what point in our history that education became, well, came from being necessary to just nice? Because that's what I, I'm taking away from this talk, that at some point in time it, it, it was necessary, that, that the black community saw a need, a necessity to educate themselves, to be as highly educated as they possibly could be. And now it's almost to have a formal education, it's nice to have. It's like, okay, it's not something that, that's, that's a must in right. this society, but, but nice. And I think that's to the root of what this young brother was getting at right mm -hmm. there. Um, from necessity to nice, I, at what point in our history that, did that come about? It happened in 1970. I'm going to tell you, it was the beginning, 1970. So again, let's go back to the history. If you have black teachers, who intentionally pass on information to black parents. And you have black ministers, whom I did not talk about, also a part of the circle. Then you have what one young woman said, my teachers are saying it, my preacher's saying it, my mama's saying it, I guess it must be right. I should go to school. So there was in segregation this dissemination of ideas. What sociologists and others have wanted to posit is that the reason the black community is so fragmented now is because the black middle class abandoned poor blacks and thereby disrupted the communication flow and the modeling. I'm not a sociologist. I don't pretend to speak to the present on that idea. But I will say this. The fragmentation of the black community is not, in terms of directionality, purely the result of black, the black middle class moving out. That's just yet one more example of blaming. If we go to 1970, there were particular political structures put in place to be sure integration would never work. Black teachers had been in collaboration with three different agencies. And their collaboration with these agencies over time helped bring about Brown and the opportunity for desegregation. But in the 1960s, their hidden collaboration with the NAACP started to fall apart. The NAACP is very interested in making sure we push for integration. The attorneys who knew how it got there, I asked Oliver Hill, who did the DSEG of UGA. When you flew to Atlanta, and who was one of the NAACP attorneys for Brown, when you flew to Atlanta, and went to litigate, where did the plaintiffs come from? And he said, the black teachers. All we did was prepare him for the witness stand. Donald Hollowell, recently deceased attorney in Atlanta, held on retainer fee by the Georgia Teachers and Education Association. Same script. So the attorneys in the 60s, with the exception of Derrick Bell, whom we all demonize because everybody gets mad because he had the audacity to say something about Brown. But Derrick Bell knew what he was talking about. Most of the 60s legal staff did not know what Thurgood Marshall knew. Thurgood Marshall and Oliver Hill and Donald Hollowell knew how we got Brown. 
but the 60s attorneys did not. And so victimized by our own, our own success, we say, we just have to get more and more desegregation. OK, well, I know y'all are saying that we need to do this for the black teachers. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we just need to get more desegregation. So you know, we might just lose the teachers. So the teachers are abandoned at that moment, that voice. And so it's right in America for us to do it. So we've got to go do it. What about the National Education Association? They had worked with teachers. And now in the late 60s, they want federal money. Everybody's got to be integrated. We're going to push this at all costs, even if it means the diminishment of black voices. We're going to push this merger. And what about the federal government? My former professor was Harold Howe. I didn't know when he was my professor what I learned about him when I was in the archives. Harold Howe got so much hate mail when he attempted to implement schooling structures that were fair. He got so much hate mail from the South that he had to be retired by Lyndon Johnson. So rather than saying the problem was created when the black middle class moved out of the black community, let's think about what the politics were. The politics were federal, they were our state associations, and they were our organizations. And in the fragmentation of what's supposed to happen, the voices that disseminated to our community, who we are, what we're supposed to be doing, what we value, got lost.